Hey guys, welcome to the second episode of Amazing Animation Analysis. Now, have you ever seen an animated show or film and thought to yourself, wow, this amazing animation is amazing, but you're not really sure why it's so amazing. Well, in this show, I take that animation and I'll analyze it and tell you exactly why it's so amazingly animated. And in this episode, I'll be analyzing the highly acclaimed anime series, One Punch Man. One Punch Man is originally a webcomic and manga series created by One. It tells the story of Saitama, a superhero who has become so powerful that he can destroy any monster villain he faces with a single punch. However, his newly acquired strength poses a problem. Saitama can't find anyone to challenge him anymore and he's become pretty bored. The anime adaption of One Punch Man has been created by Studio Madhouse. The first season is 12 episodes long and they've really outdone themselves with the animation in every single one of them. There's so much amazing animation in fact that instead of analyzing the entire series as a whole, I'll start out by just talking about the very first episode. I've grabbed all the shots and scenes from the first episode that I thought were interesting, well animated or a good resource to learn from. I'll be analyzing each one of them in detail and then we'll find out why they're so amazingly animated. We start off with this crab monster attacking Saitama. Saitama dodging it, jumping on his arm and pulling his eye out with his tie. The first thing I notice about the first shot is that the crab and Saitama are moving independently from each other. What I mean is that they're timed differently. If we watch this frame by frame, we see that the crab has two frames here, then Saitama has a frame there, then the crab again, until they sync up. This gives the feeling that they're both singular beings that act independently. This makes the shot feel more believable to us, instead of it being a shot that's been directed and animated, which of course it has been. Now let's focus on the crab monster. With a big downward swing, he throws his crab hand at Saitama. Now, as an animator, what do we want from this attack? We want it to feel believable. We want the audience to think that Saitama is in real danger. We want them to think that if he doesn't get out of the way of this claw right now, that he'll die for sure. This adds a feeling of suspense and excitement to the scene. One of the factors that makes his attack feel believable is the arc of the motion. Arcs in animation are very important to organic characters. And here's why. Let's take an arm for example. The upper arm is attached to the shoulder. The lower arm is connected to the elbow and the hand is connected to the wrist. These are pivot points. The only way the arm can move is through these pivot points and in an arcing motion. Now of course not all movements are big and use the entire arm. One can perform a stabbing action by only rotating the shoulder and keeping the lower arm and the wrist straight. There is however always something that moves in an arc. Using arcs in animation makes the character feel more organic and believable. So we see that the crab monster's arm has a nice arc. This is caused by him turning his shoulder up and down and rotating his middle. The front part of the claw follows the arc, so it gives us a nice sense of a stabbing motion. The second thing is the weight. We want the weight of the claw to feel like it could crush Saitama. This is done by making it feel like the claw is heavy to pull up and easy to drop down. The animators do this by having more frames where he has to pull it up near the top of the arc and very little frames to smash it down at the end. The more frames, the slower the action. The less frames, the faster. Having more frames at the top of the arc also helps the audience register what's going on and what's about to happen, because everything in the shot moves pretty fast. It's also nice that he uses his other claw as a counterweight for the motion. The point is rammed across by having the camera shake and the debris of the concrete flying everywhere. This however is more of a secondary animation. If the arc and the weight are messed up, camera shakes and debris aren't gonna save the animation. The crab monster's arm retracts a bit because of his muscles contracting and the ground recoiling him back because of the impact. Getting to Saitama, he gets up to see what's happening, he crouches down to get ready to jump, this is called an anticipation in animation. He jumps up to dodge the claw and goes for the arm, which leads into the next shot. The cool part of the animation is that the butt is the leading part of the jump. This is because you jump with your legs and the main part that follows is your middle. The upper body of Saitama follows behind because he was in a crouching position. I like how he actually has to spread his arms and legs in order to dodge the entire massive claw. Everything slows down at this point and the thing that moves the most at the end of the shot is Saitama. His arm starts going towards the arm of the crab monster. This leads nicely into the next shot where you immediately see his hands come down on the crab's arm which he uses as a leverage to jump from. It's important to note that if we didn't have these frames of Saitama moving that the audience might become confused as to what's happening in the next shot. Here's the transition without the frames at the end. It's not bad but with the added frames it's definitely better. Here's another nice anticipation before using his hands to jump up. I really like how these two frames work together. 
you can really see that Saitama uses his entire hand to the fullest to jump off the crab. This is because he pushes all the way back with his hands and closes them in the following frames. In the next shot, we can estimate where Saitama is by following the eyes of the crab. The tie follows Saitama and pulls on the crab's eye. The nice part is that the tie tightens around the eye and it takes a couple of frames before the eye is pulled down. This shows us that the eye is tightly secured to the crab's head and it takes a bit of strength to pull it out of its socket. It's also nice that at the end of the shot, the tie pulls downwards so we know that Saitama is on his way down from the jump. This also leads nicely to the next shot, where Saitama falls down and lands on the floor. This whole scene is just a really nicely put together, choreographed action sequence. In the last shot, Saitama starts at the top of his arc and falls down. He has more frames at the top and speeds up until he lands, where he pulls down on the eye until it eventually breaks. The tightness is created by the tie in the eye being as tightly stretched as possible. This is done by drawing the tie very thinly. There is a nice little loop where Saitama tries to pull down on the tie and the crab tries to pull up and stand. They stretch as far as possible until the eye breaks. The stretching feeling is accentuated by vibrating the characters to give a sense of muscles pulling and spasming uncontrollably. In animation, this will be done by drawing the normal stretch animation first and then rearranging the frames to make it look like they're vibrating. Next up, we have Saitama breathing heavily. What's cool about this shot is that everything moves separately and in chain reactions. The inhale comes from his body. His shoulders go up first, his head closely follows, his shoulders go down and his head follows that. It's all very subtle. What's also nice is when the mouth and the eyes open and close. His eyes and mouth actually first close when he inhales, widen when he's at the top of his breath and close a bit when he exhales. His head actually slightly tilts downwards when he's inhaling. This is accentuated by the eyes and the mouth closing. If everything in the shot would happen at the same time, his head and shoulders going up while his mouth opens on the inhale, everything closes and goes down when he exhales, this shot would look way less interesting. Okay, so next we have a shot where Saitama gets grabbed, carried way up high in the air and thrown down on a building. What's great about the grab is that the hand moves in a giant arc. It goes up a bit too far and moves down in order to grab Saitama. I like the little detail where Saitama's cape moves upwards when the hand flies past him. This further emphasizes that the hand is massive, because of the amount of air it displaces around it. Of course the fingers being closed around him in the foreground, while the screen goes dark, is awesome too. What's nice about this shot, is that we start off close to Saitama's head, to show us what predicament he's currently in. The interesting part is that not just the background moves in this shot, the hand also erratically moves around. Showing us that the cameraman can't keep up with the hand's movement, and has trouble following it, because it goes so fast. The hand quickly moves out of frame to lead into the next shot. We start off close to the hand to connect it to the previous shot and zoom out to show the entirety of the giant. The giant throws Saitama down and the camera still follows the hand to make the impact feel that more powerful. It kind of feels like we're being thrown too. Before throwing Saitama, the giant has a really clear and nice anticipation pose. His arm is thrown back extremely far, so much so that his stomach is bulging out. He's really putting his all into this throw. If we go through the animation frame by frame, we see that the giant has already swung his arm all the way down before Saitama flies into the building. This is of course highly unrealistic, but the animation isn't about something feeling realistic, it's about something feeling believable. I think they made this decision because now it actually feels like the giant is throwing Saitama. We see that the animation still works if we remove the frames while Saitama gets thrown, but now it kinda feels like the giant is punching the building himself. It's only 4 frames, but it really adds to the shot. It's cool that the building explodes per story, and that the heavy camera shake only starts when Saitama smashes into the ground. That's the point where the smash can send tremors to where the camera is positioned. Let me clarify that there's no actual camera in One Punch Man. When you position characters at a certain distance and place them in the frame, we immediately sort of create a camera viewpoint with our own minds. Now Madhouse is trying to make One Punch Man feel like it's been filmed even more by adding camera shakes and follows, etc. Next we have a shot, where the giant jumps on Saitama, who is laying somewhere under him in the rubble. You gotta love frames like these, where the outlines and colors are trailing behind the actual drawing. These are called smears, or speed lines. They accentuate the motion of the character, basically showing the friction they cause between them and the air around them. One Punch Man uses a lot of smears, but smears are a different topic to talk about altogether, for another time. The cool thing about this shot, is that the giant smashes down, and because he's so big and far away, it takes a while before the smoke and debris fly upwards. Everything also flies up in a sort of shockwave chain reaction. First the smoke flies up, and then the buildings in the foreground. 
It takes a while before the shockwave reaches us because it's so far away. This adds a sense of skill and depth to the shot. Next we have the giant doing some sort of machine gun gatling punch to Satama on the ground. He gets wilder and wilder until he finishes it off with one big punch. I've never really animated something like this, but it looks like you just draw tens of punches going towards the intended target. Most of the arms are around 2 frames. They keep adding arms and harder camera shakes to make it more violent. What's great about the final punch is that his body and his arm move backwards. Then his body moves forward to lean to the punch, but his arm is still going backwards to gather strength. The giant is essentially stretching the muscles in his chest and his arm as far away from each other as possible to maximize his punching power for when he eventually punches. Moving different body parts independently feels organic and interesting. It also makes the punch feel more powerful. I like how when he punches his arm gets all wobbly and bendy. The special effects are interesting too. They use some sort of smear and lines to tie the two shots together. They show us that we've now rotated around the hand, they let us know where we are and where the fist is gonna land. It works really well. This is a great example of how to tie shots like these together. Next we have Satama jumping up to the giant, punching him with some extensive replays and the giant falling down on the city. It's technically well done how Satama moves towards the camera. He enlarges in the right way, having lots of frames when he's far away and very few frames when he's closer to the camera. Think of an airplane that appears to move very slow when it's far away in the distance and how fast it's actually going when it's right next to you. I like the extremely erratic movements of escape. It moves so unpredictably and fast that it feels like Satama is moving at a super high speed. The screen going black and the camera doing a 180 is once again a seamless transition between shots. Seeing Satama fly up so fast and the camera needing some time to keep up with him is a great idea. Satama pulling back and getting ready to punch also leads nicely into this shot. We can actually see that Satama is already twisting his body into the punch before we switch to the next shot. This way, the next shot can immediately start with Satama punching the giant. In this shot, before the giant's head flies away, we've seen that Satama has already punched the giant, as seen here with the bulge and the opposite side of the cheeks. This little stoppage makes the punch feel heavier and more powerful. It also emphasizes how big the giant's head is by making it take time before all the energy has been displaced into it. This is what it looks like without those extra frames. It's okay, but not as powerful as this. There's even a delay in the lower jaw that makes the punch feel more powerful. Once again showing that the transmitted energy is being dispersed in waves. I like how his neck even has a real wave of energy going through it, represented by this wave here. The punch gets repeated in this replay and in this one. It's cool to see the flesh of the giant actually giving way to the power of the punch before his head flies back. I like how Satama whips his arm around in a super wide hook. His fist stops a bit at the impact point and flies further with this insane smear to reveal him making a hook. The way the head flies back is nice too. His head actually tilts downwards because of the punch being at the bottom of the face, making it fly backwards faster. We see his body giving out and dropping down sooner than the head, which is still being pushed backwards because of the punch. When the giant falls, we have his body stopping because of it being smacked on the ground. The energy of the fall needs to be transmitted somewhere, so the leg gets raised further up and back. In this scene we have Satama sleeping. He wakes up, gets caught in an attack and an entire battle ensues. I like the startled way Satama awakes. His body tightens up by moving his shoulders close to his head and again relaxes by moving them apart. This isn't a carefree and lazy way of waking up. No, Satama gets disturbed by something. Always give your animation meaning. How someone does something tells you a lot about the character and the situation they're in. By having Satama deliberately wake up in this way, you tell the audience that Satama already knows something is up. Satama gets up in this nice arc and gets attacked. It dramatically works really well to have the debris and smoke obscure our vision and then revealing that Satama's head has been grabbed by the hand. The push Satama does works well into transitioning into the next shot where he even goes down a little bit from the previous action before getting up, which is of course done in an arc. It's nice in this shot where Satama has to crouch down to catch his body from the impact of flying so fast towards the ground. Here we have Satama being punched in the face. Because he hit at the top of his body, he rotates around his axis and flies off into the wall. The rotation shows how much power is in the punch, apart from him flying off into the distance of course. I like how Satama has to use his arm to get his body up. This tells us that he's been hurt quite a bit and he uses everything he can to make getting up just a bit easier. If we were to move Satama from here to here without him using his arm, we wouldn't be giving the audience any information about his current situation. Plus, it would look pretty crappy. 
I added this shot because I thought it wasn't very good. Here we can see Satama doing a jumping kick and seemingly do a double jump in midair. Now Satama is pretty powerful but he can't fly or jump in midair, he's still human. It kind of takes you out of it considering the other amazingly animated shots. Speaking of, here we have Satama doing a majestic jump, getting followed by some earthlings and duking it out. What I'd like to say about action scenes like these is that you can have the crazy fast movements, the twirls and the jumps, but at a certain point in your fight you have to slow things down a bit so people can react to what they've seen and catch their breath. In this majestic jump for instance, it starts really fast and hectic. It slows down considerably to show us what's going on. In this jump, the frames are close together too. Here, once again. And in the turn, it slows down considerably. Once again in this shot, the monsters are timed differently. Here we have a leg sweep, an amazing camera turn, a big punch, and monsters being smashed into the concrete wall. The sweep is great, the monsters are moving around, timed differently of course, and they're not just standing still and taking the sweep. Satama is just too fast for them to react. Saitama uses his right leg as a pivot point, which stays in place, while the rest of his body spins around it really fast. He stops the sweep with his left leg. It's really nice how his pelvis and his left leg are the main points that steer the action, while the rest of his body drags behind. We can clearly see this in his arms. They're wrapped around his body because of the force of the spin. When the spin stops, they heavily rotate around his body because of the leftover energy. This adds even more of the sense of speed to the sweep. When he punches the monsters, there are some cool anime effects. Then they cut to the end result of them having been punched in the stomach. I am not an expert on anime effects, but the general idea is that the flashes are usually white, black or red. They delineate where the attack is coming from, where it's going to, the place it hits and the force it expels. It's cool that in this impact, they don't even show them flying into the concrete. They just show an effect of where they came from. The concrete breaks even more at the end for extra impact. On to this scene, where Satama is slowly walking towards the camera, the monster's reacting and Satama is saying some words and pouring his heart out. The walking shot is great. It really shows that Satama is having trouble moving through the burning debris. It also shows his determination and it's a nice build up to the next shots. The stickiness is done by moving him very slowly and shifting his entire weight on one leg when he takes a step. If he didn't correct the center of gravity like this, he would fall down. What's great here is that he contracts his upper body and his head close together to build up energy. He explodes by throwing his fist against his chest. The impact is fast, but good. You see the left side of his body getting pushed back first, because that's the place he pounded. Then the very next frame his right side follows, because of the leftover energy. I really like it in anime when they animate a shot where their head moves up and down, instead of their jaw moving up and down when they talk. It makes absolutely no sense, and you would only do this if your jaw was stopped by something when you talk. I think this is what they're trying to convey. The neck and the body is held so tight that the only part that can move up is the head. It makes everything feel more dramatic, tight and it has more of an impact. Now there's a big fight but we're gonna skip it. Because I talked about most of the techniques used here already. I'd like to focus on this punch instead. It's amazing. It's a very simple idea but it's executed very well. We have the arm and the fist coming in to punch the stomach. The fist reaches the stomach but the arm presses on. The fist has nowhere to go except in and up and the arm keeps going forward. This makes it feel like the stomach is super hard and the arm almost snaps in order to break through it. It also does a good job in separating the hand and the arm, which makes it feel more organic. I want to end the analysis on this final shot. We have a monster here swinging his swords around menacingly. It uses a lot of things really well, separating body parts from each other, using arcs and separating horizontal and vertical movement. So he moves his body to the right first, then his arms follow, then he moves his body to the left and his arms follow that. Instead of just going left and right, this makes it feel more alive. There's a horizontal sway, but vertically there's a clear beginning and end point too. He's not just looping from right to left. What's also cool about this shot, that it really feels like he has four arms and he can use them separately because of the way his arms follow each other instead of them doing the exact same thing at the exact same time. It seems like the top arm always moves before the bottom arm. This might be because the main place the force comes from are his shoulders. The arms all move in an arc too, just as a cherry on top. Now the way he moves also feels like the swords have some sort of weight to them, because he's not just moving them at the same time he's moving his body. They're being dragged behind and some of them are even pointing down. So this is it for the first episode of One Punch Man. If you liked this video, please click on the like button below. If you'd like to see more One Punch Man or something else, be sure to leave a comment. And for all you striving animators out there, I hope this video helped you on your adventure to become the animation hero of your dreams. Thanks for watching, bye bye!